So, welcome on the stage, Janis Grindhoffs, the CEO of Mass Portal. Hello, hello. Tere, tere. <laughs> uh, so, I tried to be like a warmer up to the next big uh, discussion here. And uh, what is that? Something's not right. Can you help me? With some presentation. Anyways, I can, <laughs> I can start. Like we have been, uh, well, we get the slides sorted. Uh, something's not working. All right. So at uh, at Mass Portal, we've been building 3D printers since like five years, and uh, as everyone else in this industry uh, that has uh, grown from bottom up, we started from uh, the maker community. We started from the our own need, and uh, it very much resembles us the desktop production uh, thing going on back in the 80s. I was also part of that, and uh, this thing is. Uh, the 3D printing has the potential to be used for production, uh, the same way the big media publishers used like expensive things back in the 70s. In the 80s, it all started to change, and you've seen where it's uh, now. Yeah, so uh, videos, uh, social media, everything, basically born out from the desktop production revolution. And uh, today we are uh, at the desktop uh, marketing or desktop uh, manufacturing. Revolution, and uh, we started out. Uh, we didn't know actually anything about the 3D printing uh, uses or anything, and uh, we built our machines for the guys who are uh, capable of uh, tinkering with them, pr doing like experimentation. Basically, the black belt guys, and uh, playing around, finding the new things, building crazy prototypes and stuff. But uh, down the road, we understood that this is not a big market for the 3D printing. And the big market is either on the education side or on the production side. And uh, both of those kind of customer groups require totally different attributes. Uh, they require totally different machines, totally different uh, offers from uh, companies like us. And we started investigating how, how do we go there. And uh, the obvious solution uh, today for the production looked like we take the same machines we have and uh, give them to the white belt guys who want to do something, but they don't know how and to give the same machines uh, to the production guys who are doing production. And uh, it turned out that uh, this is how the market looked for it, and this company doing these kinds of print farms uh, just closed. So uh, the MVP, that is minimum viable product, the print firm as it stands today, didn't work. And uh, it's been obvious uh, it's not working uh, because the minimum requirements are much higher for production. You can do some production, but uh, as the next discussion will uh, dive into, the hardware is hard and the level for a minimum uh, viable product is much more developed solution than probably in some other markets. So nevertheless, we want to go there because uh, with some development, and uh, some partnerships and uh, some uh, customers. Uh, this uh, certainly is the direction for the future. So uh, in our mind, the solution looks much more like a customized, automated, uh, tailor-made solution f to tackle the production issues. And uh, this is a much more expensive solution. Uh, so the, it's not like even for a large companies, it's very easy to just uh, go and uh, put down some 100,000 euro or stuff like that. So uh, we built the system. We took it around the world uh, to United States, to Germany, to the UK. And uh, essentially what we did, we launched the first uh, automated 3D production line and displayed it to a number of uh, industries. And uh, what I wanted to share with you today is uh, the experiences and not dive that much into the technology and not the applications. Because we found the customers, we found the applications, that's all true, but we also found some uh, uh, surprising moments that we <laughs> didn't anticipate when doing it. And uh, first of all, uh, it is uh, the complexity. 
uh, in any accelerator program or uh, a lot of mentors would tell you to focus hard on just one thing or uh, like generally focus. But uh, how do you focus uh, when you are doing a platform technology? You have just a lot of bricks that you need to build the whole house. If you don't have some of the bricks, you have to buy them. It's all right. So we also don't have all of them. We are sourcing some uh, components from uh, other guys. But still, it's a platform technology or technology platform, so it's a broad thing. That means your R&D efforts are uh, very large for a startup, and uh, it's like a lot of uh, different hardware units that need to work together. Uh, so uh, a lot of R&D effort. And the uh, other thing is that uh, the 3D printing uh, materials that are on the market today, they are consumer materials. They are made to be very easy, very smart. So you have to go for the industrial market materials. You have to go and look how to process the materials that are industrial grade, that are capable to produce parts. So I've been very lucky to partner up with the big chemical companies that are providing those materials to the industry for a very large time. And the problem with those materials, they need to be proce processed on a much higher uh, quality level. So the processing temperature windows, the processing speed windows, everything is uh, shrinking. The materials are not designed to be easy to use. They are designed to be performance materials. So uh, you need to make sure the materials are working uh, to the spec. And uh, again, uh, we had to do a new technology, uh, add the incredibly uh, long time of uh, R&D to our uh, already burned the team, and do the material management solution. There wasn't uh, any such thing on the market. So uh, number two, world first, we released this uh, materials drying technology just to build the brick, build the house for the production. So the materials are being processed stable. So uh, then the quality. Uh, three years ago, uh, when the 3D printing was still cool, because now it's like, you know, <laughs> not hyped anymore. So. Uh, it was like layerish, low quality. So we pushed the quality. We pushed the quality, and uh, this is the highest quality print and the technology that is thermoplastic extrusion. So again, uh, in a while, you go to the customers and you get quotes like, hey guys, you opened a new world to us. We didn't know it's possible, so we can put it into production. So again, a next brick uh, falls into place, and this to give it all uh, the automation solution or the production solution to some customers, you have to also have the software infrastructure. Again, another layer of complexity. It has to be easy, if, easy to use. It has to be single click. So for the white belt guys or the production guys, they are not about to think and they just want like something that is uh, working easily. So again, this can be done, but it is a lot of uh, complexity behind the scenes. And in the end, the automation, the hardware automation, you have to build it, you have to, you cannot uh, just uh, take a lot of uh, off-the-shelf machines and put them into racks and, like, say, they will work together. And so this is uh, what we heard a lot, our requests. We have uh, invested into a number of printers. Uh, we have a print farm of 20 units or 15 units. And uh, can you guys automate it? No. <laughs> we have to build it from scratch because there has to be some uh, hardware interfaces, there have to be some software interfaces. So essentially, this system has to be built from scratch. And we built it, we found some applications, and then we ran into the uh, more surprising part that I wanted to share with you, because this is more to do with uh, a lot of other things uh, going on here, not just 3D printing. And uh, this is non-technology issues that uh, we anticipated that uh, once we delivered the technology, uh, and it works, uh, and it's at reasonable cost, everything will fly. Uh, it doesn't, and because like those guys who are uh, craftsmen working in uh, whatever, already in a fifth, five second generation doing something like for uh, in the wood or shoes, and uh, we can cut their production time from two weeks to two days, but they are uh, not very interested <laughs> because this is new. So they want to stick to what they have already. So in, uh, in a lot of uh, those uh, verticals, we found that uh, although we can bring some very meaningful improvements for some uh, forerunning companies, the long tail is not interested. So 
uh, even more. Uh, we heard feedback like uh, going to the factory automation show, the factory uh, automation managers who we thought are our uh, most important customers, so the guys that really could put these things to use and uh, profit from the technology on day one. They come and say, oh, this is very cool. Look at the print. It's oh, performance, performance material. Very great. It's for our kids. <laughs> and then we go like, no, come on, guys. You can use it today. So it's today. It's not for your kids. No, 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 no. It's for our kids. <laughs> yeah, so a huge surprise. And the uh, second thing is uh, in automotive that we thought is uh, one of the industries that uh, we have to target. And uh, we went to the pro shows and uh, talk to those guys. And they're very interested. They're doing all kinds of uh, research and uh, piloting and everything. So essentially, what do you have? You have, uh, at first, you have some uh, engineering uh, people talking to you. And then you do this uh, part, you print. Uh, it, at first, it doesn't work. So the material is not right. The, the part is not performing as needed and everything. You try to solve those issues. And then you solve, you probably invest half a year till the part is uh, stably printing day in, day out, and it's ready. And so the engineering department says, hey, the guys, this part is working. We can put it into a production car. So now you just have to talk to our business guys to see whether the math is all right. So what's the cost of the system, what's the cost of the material, and so on. And so you spend another maybe half a year uh, talking to the business development guys, and so all those kind of. And then they sign this project in uh, another half a year, and that's already a year or a year and a half in a startup world forever. And uh, now the biggest surprise, the uh, business guys say, yeah, so we can put it into production and we can buy your system. You just have to talk to our legal guys. And the legal guys come and I say, hey, guys, but if we put this part into a car, we understand it's technically possible today. We understand the business guys are happy. But we, what if someone gets killed and we get sued? So we don't have the legal setup to defend ourselves. Uh, so we understand we have to work on it. We are starting working on it and, uh, in a year, two years, maybe, then we can deploy this. So essentially, the technology is ready today. We can deploy it, but it's not going to uh, be happen because of some legal setup. That's totally outside of our control, and this is something that has to be anticipated when you're doing something that's uh, like new. And uh, so there's a delay that is just uh, immense in the startup uh, time. Yeah, so, and uh, the totally opposite, we anticipated that in the medical market, uh, the paperwork and the legal issues and everything would be very ongoing and lengthy process. And it turned out that it's the opposite. So unlike automotive, the medical world is embracing this and very fast. And uh, they are bypassing all kinds of uh, procedures, all kinds of legal checks, all kinds of compatibility just to get this thing out and help people. and. Uh, just to make this uh, accelerate those medical workflows and like the opposite. And uh, so this brings us to the another thing that uh, is uh, the 3D printing industry is very hyped. And uh, it's probably two years ago, three years ago, it was cool. Maybe five years ago, it was one of the most hyped industries. And uh, it's going to be 30 billion by 2022, and that's a conservative estimate. And even the president of the United States wake in and uh, like, it's going to change the way we make everything. And uh, an Australian futurologist says, it, uh, there's no doubt it's going to change everything we do. So the hype has been immense. And this guy even said that uh, 3D printing uh, in the end is going to have greater impact on the society than the internet did. Think about it. Like, uh, that's the hype. And uh, this is how it looks in the very famous Gartner graph. And uh, what I can say that uh, this totally works, but uh, it is probably the most widely used in the investment community because it comes from a financial analyst point of view. And uh, actually, we've been talking to material guys in a scientific community or in the, in the makers and the maker community, and like uh, not all are very happy with this graph. And uh, so, again, three years ago, you go to TechChill, you go to some other conference. Oh, you're doing 3D printing, that's cool. Today, oh, you're still doing 3D printing? Okay. <laughs> well, 
ICO, have you heard about this one? Or artificial intelligence, oh, that's cool. Uh, this is not, not, not going down. You're probably somewhere uh, at the very bottom of this graph. So, but the point is uh, that the 3D printing has been around for 30 years. Uh, how come uh, it looks like this? So uh, the Gartner graph is not always showing the uh, technology as it uh, goes through the, uh, its development stages and everything. And if we split the graph and uh, imprint uh, that uh, the unreasonable expectations on the graph is one thing, but the reasonable expectations, the specification that the, the product uh, or the solution needs to match to be at the MVP level is, is on a different graph. And of course, they share something in common. But then you start to understand that uh, this is probably a better picture to, yeah, to think about it. And uh, so once you are going down, uh, there's no danger. It's not like the thing is going to end, or it's not like uh, it's the end of the 3D printing story or anything. And there have been numerous uh, technologies on the market that uh, didn't follow this graph. Uh, for example, uh, I wasn't alive when, there, when the nylon was invented, but it changed the fashion industry. And even before that, uh, the washing machine, it changed the fashion industry before that once again. And uh, you could argue that the washing machine in the long term had a much greater in impact that we can uh, reasonably estimate today. It's all to do with the and emancipation of women, of uh, how we uh, buy our dresses, how we wear them, how many times we change them, and so on. So a lot of technologies uh, didn't really go through this hype, probably. Uh, just uh, the long-term impact was uh, evident only later on. And uh, for example, if we go back to our 3D printing technology, if it was around for 30 years, so then the drop is probably not that great. Yeah, so, uh, because uh, the 3D printing, as we know, it, it was basically around for 30 years. It was just closed, so it wasn't open. So not many folks profited from it, and not many folks talked about it because of that reason. So the graph is not really like, uh, like that. And it's based on this uh, law by Roy Amara that uh, we tend to overestimate the effect of technology short term, but we tend to underestimate it long term. And so what about the other uh, part of the slow, the underestimation? And so we have still another graph. And this is the 3D printing industry as it evolved. We could consider it started in uh, 80s. And uh, by 2010, there was MakerBot, the Maker community emerging because of the expired patents and everything. Although the technical capability for this to happen was there already a long time ago. And uh, all of the more advanced uses of this open uh, is just happening now. So uh, if we, uh, <laughs> Eastern European <laughs> or now Nordic country, yeah, uh, startup can do the world's first uh, 3D printing automation system. So it's very, very green. So it's only, it only can, can grow. And uh, from our uh, conversations and our partnership with the world's uh, biggest materials companies, uh, this is what they share. So they are expecting the market to start to be meaningful to them at about 2020. So till then, it's just playing. There's no 3D printing market for them. Yeah, of course, they have some departments, some guys sitting there. But uh, if the hype is down now, so we are probably at the, somewhere at the lowest point or so, uh, then. The market itself is just emerging. Yeah, so then looking like this. And it's a wave that is there. Uh, we have to deal with it. And there are some ways of dealing with it. And uh, probably first is just pretending it's not there until it's too late, <laughs> or just ignoring it. And the other way is uh, having fun, investing early, getting rich quick, riding, surfing, whatever. and. Uh, the way we choose is just uh, getting through it. And uh, on the blue ocean, where the water is calmer uh, afterwards. And uh, yeah, so this is what we do. Thanks. Thank you so much. Um, I didn't want the clicker. Yeah. <laughs>
Let's uh, do some questions as well. Do we have any questions from the audience? The tough Baltic audience, oh my God, every time I have to tell you. So let's learn this like already. When I ask her, does anybody have a question? There needs to be somebody who raises their hands like, yes, I have a question. So let's try this. Does anybody have a question? Oh, please. Yes, look, this guy, two, three questions already. Excellent. The first one was there. Get, throw the catch box all over the room. Ready? Ah. Uh, <laughs> yes, excellent. I love the catch box. It's always a surprise when, when, when you ask the questions. Please go ahead. Yeah, Josep from Fractory. We are also building an online platform for on-demand manufacturing, right? You mentioned that the manufacturers tell you that in 2020, the status quo will change and they will be so seeing that uh, 3D printing is becoming like going to masters, let's say, industrial production. What are the indicators for them to say it? If I understand correctly, what is the reason why that year is uh, approximately uh, the, amount, uh, the amount of materials being sold, essentially? And uh, it's estimated today there are 1 million installed 3D printing systems today. So it's like Apple sells 1 million iPhones in a minute or so. Yeah. So this is a very, very, very small market. And the whole 3D printing market is very small yet. So for the big chemicals, uh, and in their words, uh, my belief is that the chemical industry is uh, the one that is mostly missing the action now. But they are not missing it. They are just waiting till it's worth for them. In their words, uh, if they run their production systems, they, mel they could make all the world's 3D printing material being now consumed in a matter of minutes. So the, it's just very, very, very small industry yet. Although the hype is over long ago. Yeah. <laughs> there, there was another question here I saw. Hand going on. Yes, this one. Can you, can you throw the catch box? Can you catch the catch box? Excellent. Hi. Uh, I got a pretty silly question. Can you? Please go back to the last slide. I can't. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> um, then uh, I, I saw that you have had uh, shown a whole range of the 3D printers, right? Yep. On the at the last slide. Yeah, here it yep. is. Uh, the, the 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 one of uh, on the right side, the Dynasty thing. Is it also a 3D printer? Yeah. It's, like a it's a, a huge uh, one. It's an automated print from an array of 3D printing. So, so, okay. so you have like small 3D printers in there. Yeah. So ah. because you cannot, uh, the thing about 3D printing, it's kind of slow. Okay. Uh, you only can, what you can do, you can just parallelize the things because the cost of the units themselves is quite uh, relatively inexpensive. So you can just run a lot of the systems in parallel and just do a meaningful production run and up to like. It's like a, a 3D printer farm. Yeah, but okay. uh, automated. And w what's the biggest? Uh, Object which you can produce. Oh, it depends. We are uh, not focusing on the large scale. But we on the monolith. Forty by forty, something like. Ah, uh, oh, got it. Okay, thank you. Welcome. There was another question there. Yep. Now catch box goes. Oops. Hi. 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 How do you uh, compete with those uh, other guys in the market? Because in the U.S. there are hardcore R&D guys, and in China. They're doing everything really fast. Very good question. Uh, <laughs> in China, maybe. In Japan, certainly not. And uh, in the United States, uh, I just showed the slide that the company folded there that is doing things. Uh, uh, we are doing the best we can. So there is no magic answer. That, uh, we always get asked uh, how it's possible you can print, the other guys can't. Because uh, we have this feedback from the industry that this is reference quality. Yeah, so the best surface quality in this industry. And uh, the very simple answer is we don't know. We just make everything the best we can. <laughs> I, guess so. I think this is, this is the best attitude one company can have. Don't get scared because there is competition there. Just run faster, do your best, and just try to beat everybody else. Just one minute. There are, uh, by some counts, there are 6,000 3D printing manufacturers in the world. I know for a fact I've been all around the Europe, everywhere. Uh, there are at most 20 brands maximum being sold in Europe. The mm -hmm. list is non-existent. It's somewhere in Kickstarter, in the fairy tales, in the hype, somewhere, not in the real world. <laughs> Very good. Thank you so much. Give him a big applause. <laughs>